Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen of the Government Accountability Project. In a short while, a conversation about the burgeoning grassroots campaign to reverse what our guests call a culture of secrecy and lack of accountability in Washington. But first, we meet an FDA safety officer who was secretly put under criminal investigation by her own agency for what Senator Charles Grassley determined were bogus conflict of interest charges manufactured by a drug company. Dr. Victoria Hampshire's descent into the bureaucratic dungeon followed on her recommendation that a heartworm drug for dogs, a product the FDA found to be associated with hundreds of canine fatalities, be kept off the market. Welcome, Victoria, to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. In 2004, you were working for the FDA? That's right, I was, and I still I continue to work for the FDA, and I wanted to be clear that today I'm here as a private citizen. And in 2004, what were you doing? Uh, my job title was that I was the Adverse Drug Events Coordinator uh, at the FDA. I'm also a public health service officer, and uh, my detail was at the Center for Veterinary Medicine at the FDA, and so my job was to review the safety of uh, marketed products like for Pro Heart animals. 6, yes, uh -huh. which is this uh, heartworm product. And, That's right. And what did you find out about uh, Pro Heart 6? Well, I, I, you know, in the capacity of surveying the severity and frequency of adverse events that uh, all, all of, for all of the marketed drugs that we were watching, I, I thought that the uh, adverse events were unusual, unusually high in their severity and frequency and similarity of timing of the events. And so you raised an issue internally about this, and you didn't get a lot of response, but then there were a lot of complaints coming in from dog owners, and there were a lot of articles in the news media, and then you were invited by your center directors, I understand, to make a presentation, a slide, pro, a provide a, a PowerPoint slideshow about the uh, Pro Heart 6. Is that right? Uh, Yes, for the most part. There, there was a considerable response among the safety officers and the, the uh, people at the division level were, were very concerned. It was, it was a, a slow action that was, was the uh, difficulty I experienced. And then, but when you did make your presentation, uh, then the center agreed with you and they... They were very concerned. Yeah, they were very concerned and so what did they do? Well, they took the matter to the commissioner, and the uh, com commissioner, of course, may make the recommendations uh, as to uh, what the uh, what the regulatory action should be. And and that was to pull it from the market. Well, to no, to recall it. Mm -hmm. uh, a recall is different than a withdrawal in that uh, it's, it's sort of a temporary suspension and gives giving the agency and other experts perhaps even um, experts uh, outside the agency that the agency might uh, and or the drug company may uh, request help from could anal better analyze the adverse events. And the drug company here, it's a subsidiary of Wyeth called Fort Dodge Animal Health. Uh, they weren't happy with that outcome at all. They didn't want this. Uh, and so the uh, Thomas Corcoran, who is the head of that company, approached the director of uh, the Center for Veterinary Medicine at FDA um, and said that he wanted all of the records of the presentation that you made so that uh, they could challenge it in the subsequent uh, advisory committee. And they also wanted the list of all of the academicians that you relied on. And as I understand it, Dr. Sunloff uh, provided uh, most of the slideshow, but not the list of academicians. But that didn't satisfy uh, uh, Dr. Corcoran from Fort Dodge, did it? Well, of course, I wasn't aware of this until I read the report, but right. apparently not. And so he went back to Dr. Sunloff, and in fact, uh, Dr. Corcoran's uh, contemporaneous notes about his telephone conversation with Dr. Sunloff, he writes, I assured him, that would be Dr. Sunloff, this would be carried to the highest levels, and I wasn't speaking of FDA. He stated, message received. Now, we don't know exactly who he was talking about above FDA, perhaps the White House. Was the message received to Dr. Sunloff then? Uh, did he hold, stand his ground? Uh, no. And what happened? Well, uh, uh, apparently he did, in fact, turn over all of the slides, uh, which were considered uh, to be deliberative process. So an agency, uh, confidential information within the agency. And, and Fort Dodge went beyond this, Wyeth went beyond this, and they hired a public relations firm, Gaminder and Associates, 
Uh, and what was their function as you look back on this and having read uh, Senator Grassley's reports? Well, it, it appears that uh, the people who eventually uh, tried to uh, obtain evidence to indicate that I might be guilty of a conflict of interest were in fact engaged as private agents by this, this company. Mm -hmm. And what did they do as private agents? What, what were they assigned to do? In, in well, as a practicing veterinarian in, in my approved and disclosed outside activities, I had an associated pharmacy account and uh, with a, a, a very um, commonly known entity and the uh, agents attempted to procure competitor heartworm products, which are prescription products, and they failed in those attempts because uh, they didn't have a prescription that was written by me for for those products and uh, and so instead they purchased over-the-counter products from from this uh, entity and uh, had them shipped to their address unbeknownst to me because I really wasn't in the habit of checking my pharmacy records on a regular basis I had such a small I, pr I probably wrote about 14 prescriptions a year total uh, for uh, various either old clients, friends, or family whose pets I knew well and had a veterinary client-patient relationship with. So it was a very, it was insensible for me to be checking. I never checked the pharmacy records. I wasn't counting on any income from that entity at that what stage did, of my life. And what did they do with this information that they gathered about <laughs> Well, they, you? they saved, um, they saved the shipping information, the rec the purchase records, and they, they took the um, information to Dr. Crawford. And, and this would be in a private session on November 19th, 2004. Right. Uh, Dr. Crawford, who was the acting commissioner of the FDA, his general counsel, Dan Troy, then met with uh, Bob Esner, who is the chairman and CEO of Wyeth. And uh, Esner presented his own slideshow, and it was uh, ostensibly uh, showing that you had a conflict of interest, that you were promoting a a rival product on uh, through this apparent um, website that you were selling products over, which uh, seems not to be quite the case, and also that you were biased against them. Well, it is the case that the website had, um, you know, was an active website. Um, it had the potential for creating a conflict of interest, and I would like to say that I fully expect to be accountable in that respect as a federal employee. My, you know, for some 15 years at that stage. But um, it, it was it, it was an improper, I think, or and or misleading presentation of what really existed, which was a, a moonlighting activity, which was fully disclosed and an associated pharmacy account. And most of and, the purchases were actually made by the private investigators right. and, and the consultants that Wyeth hired uh, to dig up dirt on you. And they were able to purchase them because it was an, because they were over the, they were products you could mm -hmm. buy at PetSmart. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the money, of course, went directly to the pharmacy, not, not to me. And so what was the upshot of this meeting? Uh, what was the result for you? Well, I didn't, of course, as you know, I didn't know about the meeting. Uh, I was simply reassigned on January the 7th, 2005, uh, 2005 um, and with no, no real explanation other than to say that, uh, that uh, I think the exact phrase was that Wyeth had pulled all plugs at the level of the commissioner. Uh, and that was the only thing I was permitted to know, and that uh, I was told that hopefully I would be vindicated after the public meeting, and that. And the public meeting was held, but you didn't appear there. I what was happened? asked not to come to the public meeting, and, and I, I took annual leave. Um, what was the result for the drug? The drug, the drug was found to be narrowly found to be uh, unsafe uh, by a vote of one, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so after that, did the FDA let you be? No. What happened? Well, I had, in the meantime, knowing that the knowing that the uh, complaint had taken level at, at, at taken place at the level of commissioner, I had been to visit a United States congressman, uh, and they were aware of that because he he had written a letter which arrived the day before the public meeting. Subsequent to that, I was um, apparent. I was asked for a renewal of the outside activity, which I at that point had considered inactive, and even though I had disclosed it on my financial disclosure forms, um, I. I complied with the request and filed the outside activity, but in the meantime, they, they were continuing a, a conflict of interest allegation, unbeknownst to me, a, a criminal filing with the U.S. Attorney. And they took it to the U.S. Attorney in Maryland, but the, the, uh, the prosecutor declined to, to right. go forward with the case. 
and ultimately you were completely vindicated on any questions of fraud as well. Um, in, um, during the summer of 2005, FDA got a letter from a veterinarian in Alabama, I believe it was. Uh, what was that about? Well, I had worked with this particular veterinarian as an NIH uh, public health service veterinarian in way uh, some 10 years ago, and uh, this veterinarian was practicing in Alabama at the time, and and uh, a sales rep from Fort Dodge, uh, according to the story, walked into her office and, and explained that for that this product would be eventually back on the market, and that uh, it was only removed because of a corrupt safety officer at the uh, FDA and. And that you had earned how much money from the sale I of the product? I think the figure was around seventy thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways, um, Congress took an interest in this and continues to. What's the current state of Congress's investigation of FDA and Wyeth? Well, I'm not really sure because I'm, I'm of course, peripheral to it now. I, I don't understand what what uh, the current state is, other than that it's open. Okay. Uh, there are ongoing questions about. Um, you know, the decisions being made now. Mm -hmm. And um, you are in a new job at FDA. Are you, um, where is that and are you happy with it? Yeah, the, if there is a silver lining in my story, it, I, it would be to say that I work for a healthier FDA and and that the, just by, you know, I re refused the reassignment that, um, that that was in mind and I I was reassigned temporarily to an office level and then I took a detail in another center that I'm very happy in. It turned out just, just by chance to be a very, just exactly the type of structure I was hoping, had hoped for and had always worked for in the department. Uh, so it, you know, it's very meaningful work and I'm very pleased to have the colleagues I have and, and the leadership there. Well, not all whistleblower stories have happy endings. Uh, Victoria Hampshire's does uh, and uh, we're pleased to say that she was actually named Public Health Service Veterinarian of the Year in 2006 and largely for your work on ProHeart 6. Thank you. Uh, when we return, reversing the culture of secrecy and unaccountable power in Washington. Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. After eight years of unprecedented assertions of executive power and government secrecy and an ongoing judicial rollback of employee free speech rights, Congress and the next president are being called upon to enact historic openness and accountability reforms. With us are two leading proponents of such reforms. Gary Bass says it's a question of the public's right to know. Gary is the founder and executive director of OMB Watch, a nonprofit research and advocacy organization that promotes greater accountability and transparency and increased citizen participation in public policy decisions. Also with us, Tom Devine, legal director for the Government Accountability Project, the nation's leading advocate for whistleblowers and whistleblower rights. I also work at the Government Accountability Project. Welcome, Tom and Gary, to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Uh, Gary, let's start with you. How about an overview of the state of accountability and secrecy in government? Where are we? Well, secrecy has been a problem for many administrations, and it seems every president promises to be more open. Though the last eight years has accelerated the problem, particularly after 9-11, this president believes strongly, very strongly, in a very centralized White House, one in which control of information is essential. So we've seen on many, many fronts information that once was publicly available no longer being available. Even more broadly, what we also have is a situation where information that should be publicly available in today's electronic world no longer are not able to really obtain. So this manifests itself in so many ways, Mark. I mean, all of us see the 
post-Katrina situations that occurred or the war in Iraq, and we see the abuses of contract dollars, and yet we can't really find out who's getting what money and how it's actually occurring. And your organization is trying to put this issue on the agenda and in the uh, context of the presidential campaign this year and has uh, advanced five questions for candidates uh, about openness issues. And at the top of the list is the question of manipulation of facts by agencies and White House pressure on agencies uh, to come to certain conclusions. Talk about that. The integrity of science has really been challenged in the Bush administration uh, to the extent where civil service staff and the operation of government is put aside for the interest for special interest uh, uh, agendas. And we see this in so many ways, Mark. I mean, virtually every regulatory agenda item, whether it's about safe food, whether it's clean air, whether it's about workplace safety, has had the situation where the science is put aside for political purposes. In a certain sense, though, isn't that what we elected? We chose this particular team to lead the country, uh, and they get to lead the agencies, the executive agencies, as they see fit, right? Well, no doubt we pay the consequences for who we elect. But by the same token, I don't think anybody elected the president thinking that it was going to be an open door for special interests, for allowing backdoor deals to occur, or to allow the whole operation, whether it's regulatory or the operation of government in general, to tilt so heavily in favor of special interests. Another uh, item on your top five list is the question of executive privilege and how far that extends. Talk about that. Well, this president has utilized the state secrets privilege more than any other president um, in history, for that matter. Uh, this is an important issue where even Congress can't obtain information. So the notion of oversight or accountability is enormously diminished on every aspect, whether it deals with the war in Iraq or whether it deals with mundane daily issues such as the cost of Medicare prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. And another uh, major issue that you're uh, advancing is the question of whistleblower rights, which is, of course, an issue near and dear to Tom's heart. Uh, and in particular, what uh, OMB Watch is concerned about is the right of whistleblowers in the private sector to advance the interests of public health and safety. Tom, what is the state of private sector workers' uh, whistleblower rights? It's a crazy quilt patchwork of hit or mostly missed protections that's legal anarchy. Uh, neither employers nor workers know what the boundaries are for legally protected freedom of speech in the corporate sector. Uh, this is something which is changing. Congress this year has passed best practice free speech laws uh, enforced by jury trials for 20 million workers uh, connected with retail sales and the Consumer Product Safety Commission bill a few weeks ago uh, for defense contractor employees um, so that they can be the public's eyes and ears for $400 billion uh, in spending there, and all the ground transportation workers in the 9-11 bill. What's needed now is to get one coherent, consistent set of rules that apply to everyone uh, for private sector challenges to corporate illegality. Uh, and what about public sector workers and, and their whistleblower rights? There have been whistleblower laws on the books in the federal sector for decades. Uh, aren't they well protected? Uh, well, we've had a, a Trojan horse for federal employees who want to act as public servants uh, since 1978. And the whistleblower law gives them the, the right to spend uh, tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars in years of their life to get whatever harassment they challenge rubber stamped. Uh, the whistleblower laws are almost like the final nail in the professional coffin for any government employee who takes their rights seriously. And they've learned they don't take their rights seriously. But I, I don't really understand how that could be. Congress passes a law, and it says that workers who um, come forward with disclosures about wrongdoing uh, are to be protected. Uh, what happened? Uh, the Achilles heel was uh, minor league due process to enforce your rights. You can't get a fair day in court. Uh, your day in court is before a, a bureaucratic uh, board 
that uh, has no political independence is pretty much the lowest common denominator of the legal system. And the folks there know better than to challenge the powers that be who are engaged in retaliation, usually they outrank the hearing officers. Uh, and then uh, all the appeals get funneled into one specialty court, uh, the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, which has the same attitude towards freedom of speech as the FISA court does towards civil liberties. Um, the track record since October 1994, when Congress passed the strongest free speech law in history on paper, is two and 203 against whistleblowers. For two wins, 203 losses. Two wins, 203 losses. You don't have a chance there. It's a way to rubber stamp whatever retaliation the government wants to engage in. Now, there's new legislation uh, that is pending, right, to uh, rectify this. Uh, the House passed uh, an overhaul of the, the whistleblower law in March 2007, the Senate last December, and they've been bogged down now for almost eight months trying to reconcile the differences between their versions. And what, what are the significant differences? Um, the Senate passed what we, they thought was a safe law. Uh, it basically restored all the paper rights, but uh, essentially kept the same structure intact. Um, and uh, the House passed structural reforms, giving whistleblowers access to juries to actually determine justice and applying the law where it didn't to FBI and intelligence agency employees who are really the front lines of a lot of the most significant disclosures currently. Um, the Senate said, well, we want to get something done, that's, and so we want to go with the safe version. We've said, no. This is a dangerous version for whistleblowers. It's fatal for whistleblowers. We've tried it three times now. In 1978, Congress first passed those rights. They were gutted by judicial activism. 89, they did it again. Um, 94, Congress passed it a third time. The courts completely threw it out and turned the law into a trap. We have to get first class rights to enforce uh, the paper free speech protections. And um, the Senate folks have said um, they're going to go for it. In the next month will be the moment of truth, whether government employees have the right to be public servants. But what uh, about, what about uh, employees who are working in sensitive areas regarding national security? Uh, um, their disclosures can cause tremendous harm to the national interest. Shouldn't there be uh, limitations on their rights to come forward? Uh, their disclosures are probably the ones that are the most significant for protecting national security. Uh, these people aren't publicity hounds or hot dogs. They're seasoned professionals who speak out when there's been a breakdown within the bureaucracy and it's asleep at the switch. They had warned that 9-11 was inevitable and in fact at the same gate that the hijackers used in Boston's Logan Airport two months before 9-11. Um, our national security whistleblowers had breached security, warned that we had to do something serious, and been ignored. Uh, we proceed at our own risk when we ignore the voices of the professionals. And the whistleblower law doesn't give them the right to call a press conference. It gives them the right to safely tell their superiors uh, that there's a problem, or warn Congress if the bureaucracy doesn't want to deal with something. Uh, it gives them the right to make a difference before it's too late. And I, I would also add, Mark, I think there are two problems. One is that increasingly we're defining too many items under homeland security and national security. This is a creeping kind of approach. Give me an example. Well, I, an example I deal with in the environmental area is information around toxic releases in the community. They come out in a risk management plan. Now, many people would say, that information about risks in our community is a blueprint for terrorists and should not be publicly available. The flip of that is, don't parents have a right to know where their kids, if a daycare center is next door to a, a potentially dangerous situation, or your house, or whatever it may be. My, I err on the side that disclosure is actually helpful in resolving problems. We can then deal with the root problems in our communities, not with hiding them. So I think your point Tom, is incredibly important that the reporting of a whistleblower is to the supervisor. It is not necessarily going to the media and creating um, some kind of a, a situation that creates public problems. Or Congress, he said. Or and Congress. one of the issues that uh, gets raised about the, the dangers of extending whistleblower protection that far is that uh, Congress itself is a sieve. 
uh, and that information uh, isn't reliably uh, protected when it goes to Congress? How do you ensure that it will be? Well, we either decide that we're going to trust the system of an elected government or we don't. Um, but all of the whistleblower laws which would give disclosure rights to Congress require that the same controls be applied as if you were talking to another bureaucrat. Uh, the congressperson has to have a need to know that information if it's classified, uh, and um, they have to have the appropriate level of security clearance so that they're qualified, eligible to receive it. Uh, the idea that um, you can talk to any bureaucrat in the Pentagon um, uh, uh, and be operating within the rules uh, but you can't talk to the other branch of government which is responsible to oversee the Pentagon is how we end up with the sort of fiascos that our country's been suffering from. In today's world, uh, we've seen in the last eight years defense contracts double in size, but the number of full-time equivalents working on audits have actually gone down during that time frame. We're not capable of monitoring how the dollars are being spent, particularly in things like the War of Iraq. The General Accounting Office, um, uh, the Government Accountability Office, rather, a new name for it, um, uh, which is really the monitor on these things, recently reported that there were all kinds of shenanigans going on within that, that office that was doing the auditing. And it was really because whistleblowers came forward that were even able to know that those kinds of problems exist. We're about out of time. I'm wondering. Is this new law that is pending and been kicked around for eight months, is it going to become law? It will become law if folks like your viewers um, make their voices heard. Uh, we need everyone who's watching this show to contact their senators and tell Senator Reid that we need floor time in September to pass the Whistleblower Protection Act. There's liable to be an effort to filibuster, procedurally sabotage it. And they need to get in touch with Senator Reid and say, find floor time for a whistleblower rights law that allows all employees paid by the taxpayers to have free speech rights enforced by jury trials. 202-224-3121. That gets you to Congress. Ask for Senator Reid's office. And many thanks to uh, Government Accountability's uh, Project's Tom Devine and OMB Watch's Gary Bass for walking us through uh, the right to know and whistleblower rights agendas that are competing for center stage in Washington. For Whistleblower Your Work, I'm Mark Cohen.